I want to speak on the socialist revolution process. And in this talk, I want to do three things. Firstly, I want to discuss the conditions of any revolution, given past experiences. Secondly, I want to look at what our party's response and strategy should be in the likeliest scenario or set of scenarios. And thirdly, I want to consider what our programme for revolution might be for the revolutionary event. I'm hoping that in the question section afterwards we can explore further concrete revolutionary proposals. Now, the party has over the years seemed to settle into an incrementalist conception of revolution, which was, you know, by and large uh, current at the, the turn of the century when it was uh, formed. If not um, every last Hottentot, then at least an electoral majority for socialism long prior to any revolutionary event. I give fair, fair warning now that this approach would seem to be seriously flawed, indeed unrealistic, uh, given the history of revolution within capitalism. The central point to remember for all previous revolutions is that the revolutionaries do not make the revolution. The incumbents lose one. The analogy would be the rugby scrum. Whilst in principle a powerful scrum could take the ball all the way down the field, in practice what happens is that one side loses the struggle, the ball goes into play and is taken rapidly down the field. Yeah. One could characterise this as an avalanche model. The field, for us, is that of political legitimacy. And vying for this legitimacy are various political groupings, all, as we know, wishing to run capitalism in various ways, for various sectional interests. At the end, the preservation of capital becomes paramount. And here, even most world revolutionary groups can serve capital in the end. It has been well said, I think by Paul Matic, that uh, Marxism is the last refuge of the bourgeoisie. But we enter this field with a different purpose. We wish to abolish capitalism itself. But the context remains the same for us as these other groups until we are in a position as the lead opposition faction to change the nature of the struggle itself, to change the field. For the majority of our party's revolutionary trajectory, therefore, we will be limited by the same factors as these other groupings. Turning this around, however, it does mean, on a positive side, that we have just as much to learn from past revolutions as these other groups, so history will serve. We have an ongoing situation at the moment. Well, when I wrote this, it was an ongoing situation. I haven't heard a peep from it recently. Um, that of Iran. Now, that may have uh, settled itself down and be... Uh, uh, have been uh, forced into submission now, but when I was writing, certainly, uh, there was a current contest. Now, that contest was merely between billionaire clerics. Um, the stakes were such as to, uh, to, whilst it was only between these like, you know, uh, different factions in the regime, the actual stakes were such as to potentially permanently shift the political landscape in favour of either a more outward-looking Iran, trying to get international investment, or continuing an increased fundamentalism, which is basically a nationalist Iran, controlling its resources. Uh, each, each of which strategies would permanently exclude one or the other faction politically, and therefore the stakes are very high for them. The stakes are those of survival. Where ca um, so, um, in this situation, we are now past you know, democracy. What happened is that they had an election, and then it was stolen in whole or in part. So this is the point where capitalists stop, um, stop making their arguments and letting workers choose between them, which is what they do in what they consider to be democracy, and it takes us into the realm of naked power and stolen elections. In short, it was a revolution in capitalism, if a minor one, and something to look at. Now, one commentator on the crisis, I'm told reliably that his name is Badgett. It's one of these sort of, you know, upper class names, Bagahote, it's, it's spelled. I think it's meant to be Badgett. Uh, anyway, Badgett of The Economist, uh, at the time, compiled a very useful checklist for success for this and other situations, focusing on the period of the fall of the Eastern Bloc and after. So he's looking at, um, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, he's looking at, um, you know, sort of, uh, Yugoslavia, and then also across Georgia and now Iran. 
that, that, those kind of evolutions. And he picks out these, these points. Number one, there has to be a critical mass. 5,000 to 10,000 people can be beaten up or arrested. 500,000 can't be. Opposition leaders need to get big numbers out on the streets and then keep them there using interim goals and incentives to maintain interest and morale. Two, <coughs> weak or divided security services, which of course comes with scarecrows. Three, at least some independent media. Four, money, which in turn means an economy with various competing concentrations of wealth and power. Five, serious corruption generally the main mass motivator. Six, it helps if the opposition leaders have had a stint in government, perhaps during a relatively liberal phase, enabling them to raise their profiles as both Mikhail Saakashvili and Viktor Yushchenko did for respectively Georgia and Ukraine. Seven, the history of it. It often seems to be the case that opposition movements have a go at ousting a nasty regime, fail, but then regroup, learn their lessons, perhaps seek help from outside, and finish the job a few years later. Eight, strong support for the opposition in the capital city. Nine, and then perhaps a, a prelude, is a rigged election, providing a peg for pre-existing grievances and a clear opposition agenda. He then adds a 10, the intervention of big foreign powers, America and the Europeans, he cites, can sometimes help, whether through encouragement or the prevention of violence. Now, this is not my checklist, this is his. And the more alert amongst you may have noticed that this checklist is more one for an extended coup than what we would consider a revolution. Whilst, for example, Edward Lukbuk's schema for coup d'etat, for example, was for <coughs> military overthrow in the Third World of the 1960s, this is more for the 21st century and the First or Second World. Absent from this list is any concept of self-direction by the revolution's mass participants. It is an elite theory, and noticeably one that most of the hard left would be entirely comfortable with. But it does describe well the situation of the last 20 years in regimes at least partly beholden to democratic traditions. Can we learn any lessons from this ourselves? Firstly, the precondition for a successful revolution is the illegitimacy of the current regime. Secondly, critical mass works. The number one priority of any revolutionary movement has to be to get people onto the streets, en masse, and keep them there. Thirdly, location is important. Sorry, Robert, but 500,000 people in Cumbria is not a revolution. <laughs> 500,000 people in London is. Fourthly, mass communication, whether internet, papers, leaflets, mobile phones, TV, radio, whatever, all of these are important. Fifthly, the security forces, again with uh, scare quotes, the security forces have to blink. The Chinese successfully suppressed Tiananmen by going right through their army's order of battle until they found troops on the Mongolian border who were prepared to fire on demonstrators, and then they successfully crushed it. If you look at China now, Tiananmen is basically a non-event for Chinese politics. A lot of the Chinese have grown up just with uh, <coughs> suppressed media that hasn't told them about it. So that is how a regime successfully suppresses it. It finds uh, forces that are prepared to do the job, and then it just goes straight out, and then your people on the streets are in trouble. Sixthly, as well, for the period of revolutionary development, you must be free of external intervention. 